As the sun rose over Gold Beach on D-Day, a maelstrom of bullets, bombs, and mortar fire tore open the morning skies. Amidst the frenzied bedlam of battle, Company Sergeant Major Stanley Hollis led D Company of the 6th Green Howards storming forward beyond the beachhead towards their target, the fearsome German heavy naval artillery up ahead. The area was supposed to have already been cleared of enemy troops, but suddenly D Company found themselves unexpectedly facing machine gun fire from a pair of pillboxes that had somehow been missed. Without blinking an eye, Hollis bravely sprinted over 30 yards towards the first, skillfully dodging the flurry of ammunition flying towards him as he hurriedly dashed across the dangerous open ground. Miraculously making it to the pillbox unscathed, he then wedged his trusty Sten gun through the slit and let rip, emptying his magazine on the Nazi soldiers hiding out inside. Out of ammunition, the quick-thinking Hollis rapidly jumped atop the pillbox, lying prone as he threw a grenade through the door before rushing in to take any survivors prisoner. It was undoubtedly a heroic act, but the so-called longest day was just beginning, and Hollis and his men would have to pull out all the stops to make it out alive. Born on September 21st, 1912, in the northern English town of Middlesbrough, Stanley Hollis had never shied away from adventure. In 1929, at the age of 17, he felt the calling of the high seas and signed up with a shipping company in nearby Whitby as an apprentice navigation officer. Before long, he was boldly sailing off to exotic locations in West Africa, but unfortunately for Hollis, his career in the Merchant Navy was prematurely cut short the following year when he contracted Blackwater Fever, a complication of malaria infection. Upon recovery, he settled down to start a family and took a job as a truck driver, but by 1939, as the dark clouds of war began looming over Europe, he once again found himself drawn to the action and decided to enlist in the Territorial Army, joining the 4th Battalion of the Green Howard's Infantry. When World War II finally broke out, he was mobilized and transferred to the 6th Battalion of the same regiment. Before long, he shipped out to France as part of the British Expeditionary Force, or BEF. In May 1940, as the Nazi Blitzkrieg steamrolled its way through Western Europe and cornered the BEF in Dunkirk, Hollis served as his commanding officer's dispatch rider, despite never having operated a motorcycle before. Riding through the chaos from town to town, the unwavering courage he demonstrated in his efforts to maintain communication during those difficult days earned him a promotion from Lance Corporal to Sergeant. On May 29th, as the German net around the Channel Port closed in, at just a few minutes' notice, Stanley and five of his fellow Green Howards were given an important high-risk mission. In order to prevent the 2nd Battalion of Welsh Guards from being trapped by the Wehrmacht, they were to help them escape by creating a distraction. With no time to waste, the six soldiers grabbed a trio of Bren guns and piled into a truck, which they frantically barreled toward the German position. Catching sight of the enemy, they dove out and unleashed a flurry of bullets, keeping the Nazi soldiers occupied for just long enough to allow the Welsh guards to make their getaway. Back in England, Hollis and his comrades' active bravery earned them a recommendation for the military medal, but this honor was denied to them by a petty sergeant major, who, upon finding the men celebrating their moment of glory, accused them of being drunk despite them having only drunk half a pint of beer each. Although the British had now withdrawn from continental Europe, the sun-scorched sands of the Sahara Desert provided a new theater of intense fighting. After a period of regrouping and retraining, as well as a spell in the Middle East, in February 1942, Hollis and the 6th Green Howards headed for Libya to join the newly formed 8th Army in a dusty struggle against General Erwin Rommel's Africa Corps and their Italian allies. The crucial moment would come that fall, as the two sides came to a deadly face-off in the town of El Alamein on Egypt's Mediterranean coast. The ensuing battle would last 13 nail-biting days, as General Bernard Montgomery led the British and Commonwealth forces in a daring assault on the Axis stronghold. In the midst of the showdown, Hollis, driving a Bren gun carrier, received word of a German 60-ton Tiger tank blocking the path of a company of Green Howards. Thinking on his feet, Hollis sped into action armed with a gammon bomb, taking advantage of his carrier's low-slung form to sneak below the firing line of the Tiger's powerful 88mm gun. Jumping out of his gun carrier, he stuck the bomb on the hull of the tank and escaped just as quickly, a smile of smug satisfaction on his face as he heard it blow the vehicle to pieces. Thanks to Hollis's resourcefulness and valor, the Green Howards could advance, and the resulting victory for the Allies would prove a major turning point in the war. Patrolling the western desert later that year, Hollis would once again find himself in a Bren gun carrier. Suddenly coming under fire from German shells, he and his comrades rushed to exit the vehicle. As he hastily jumped down to the ground, he alerted his fellow troops of the terrible mistake he had made. 
Below his foot was a German S-mine or Bouncing Betty. In a nerve-wracking moment, knowing that even the slightest movement would send the mine shooting ten feet in the air before exploding with terrible consequences for the whole unit, Hollis heroically ground his boot on it. Fortunately, the mine detonated in the ground, causing no harm except some bruising to Hollis's foot, and the men's lives were saved. Unfortunately, Hollis's luck would soon run out when he was captured by the Germans and bundled off to a desert transit prison camp. There, he was maintained on a diet of potato peels and suffered broken cheekbones and a cracked skull. Yet, he remained resilient, refusing to let the rough treatment get the better of him. Word of Hollis's impressive strength of character soon found its way to the German top brass, and before long, Ervin Rommel himself would request a meeting to personally congratulate him. Though Hollis detested what the Nazis represented, he would later say that he held great respect for Rommel as a soldier. Soon afterwards, Hollis escaped from his captors with the help of some friends and managed to make it back to Britain, where he had metal plates inserted in his face to help with the injuries he'd received at the prison camp. As soon as he'd recuperated, he headed straight back to the front lines as the Green Howards joined the massive invasion of Sicily in July 1943. During the tough campaign that finally enabled the Allies to capture the island, Hollis displayed exceptional gallantry on the battlefield, which would see him recommended for the Distinguished Conduct Medal. However, he also received another head wound, sidelining him from the action for three months while he recovered. But Hollis, impossible to keep down, would soon be back on his feet to join the Green Howards as part of the largest amphibious operation in history. In the ominous darkness of the early hours of June 6, 1944, the Green Howards nervously made their way across the English Channel in a cramped landing craft to their destiny in northern France, just a tiny fraction of the 150,000 Allied troops about to reinvade mainland Europe as part of Operation Overlord in the hope of freeing it from the Nazi jackboot once and for all. Stanley Hollis was now 31 years old, making him one of the older soldiers who would fight that day. The several years of frontline experience already under his belt would prove crucial as he prepared to go into battle with D Company. As morning broke and the Allies reached the shore, all hell broke loose. The normally tranquil beaches of Normandy, now the scenes of carnage, as the Wehrmacht greeted the disembarking soldiers with a relentless barrage of ammunition. Gold Beach was no exception, but as the Allies gradually pushed the enemy back from the coast, D Company was free to advance toward their target, a German heavy artillery unit. However, along the way, they were caught by a surprise attack from a pair of enemy pillboxes that they mistakenly believed had already been neutralized. Hollis didn't give a second thought to making a daring charge through a hail of gunfire to single-handedly take out the first pillbox, combining his Sten gun with a grenade to devastating effect. When asked why he had decided to make such a risky move, he simply said, quote, Because I was a Green Howard. By the time the morning neared its end, the Green Howards had nearly accomplished their initial objectives. Despite the anticipated heavy losses, the actual number of casualties was surprisingly lower. Nevertheless, their commander, Colonel Hastings, faced the grim reality of losing many of his key officers, including the leaders of two companies. The situation was particularly dire for the 16th Platoon, as neither their platoon leader nor their sergeant had survived, prompting Major Ronald Lofthouse of D Company to assign Hollis to take charge. After successfully liberating the village of Crepon, Hollis's platoon was then tasked with investigating a solitary farmhouse to the west. As they entered the courtyard, they discovered it deserted, save for a frightened ten-year-old boy hiding in a corner. While surveying the backyard, shielded by a stone wall, Hollis noticed an orchard ahead. A sudden gunshot rang out, narrowly missing him and striking the wall. Peering through a gap in a distant hedge, Hollis initially spotted two dogs, but his attention quickly turned to what seemed like a concealed enemy artillery piece. After reporting this to Major Lofthouse, Hollis received the green light to neutralize the threat. Now armed with a hefty Piat projectile, infantry, anti-tank launcher, and flanked by two Bren gunners, the intrepid Hollis stealthily maneuvered through a rhubarb patch toward the enemy. Getting into position, he loaded the Piat, took aim, and sent a powerful rocket hurtling toward the German field gun. But to his horror, it fell short. It would now be the British soldier's turn to be the target, as a shell suddenly came flying in their direction, almost skimming the top of Hollis's head as it crashed into the farmhouse behind them. After desperately crawling to safety, Hollis informed Lofthouse of the situation. But despite the looming danger, the Major ordered the company to continue southward, deeming the enemy gun not a direct threat to their route. However, the battle was far from over for Hollis. Hearing Bren gunfire from the rhubarb patch, 
he realized the two gunners who had accompanied him were injured and hadn't managed to retreat. Driven by a sense of responsibility, Hollis grabbed a Bren gun and dashed back toward the enemy, once more braving the onslaught of enemy bullets as he fired relentlessly from the waist to cover his comrades' withdrawal. He kept on shooting until he could see they'd made it out of range of the German guns, at which point he broke off his attack to follow them, running to safety as fast as his legs would take him, and narrowly avoiding being hit by the bullets streaking past. He would later say of his valiant rescue, quote, I got them into all this, so it was my job to get them out. Though a wounded leg forced him to return to England in September 1944, Stanley Hollis's inspiring deeds on D-Day would earn him a promotion to warrant officer second class, as well as the Victoria Cross, the highest and most prestigious decoration of the British military honor system, which he was presented by King George VI on October 10th. It was a just reward and the pinnacle of a wartime career which, time and time again, had seen him putting his life on the line to save his fellow soldiers. He was the only soldier to be awarded the Victoria Cross for actions on D-Day. As World War II came to an end, Hollis left military life behind, working for a time as a sandblaster in the local steelworks, before returning to a life at sea as a ship's engineer in the Far East. Upon his return, he took over a pub, which he would soon rename the Green Howard, in honor of the regiment he'd been willing to sacrifice so much for. Since passing away on February 8, 1972, Hollis has left a deep legacy. Not only does he have a street and a school named in his honor, but there have also been statues of him erected in both his birthplace of Middlesbrough and the French village of Crepon, which he helped liberate on D-Day, thus ensuring that the memory of his heroism will live on for many years to come. <laughs>